Hello there. So we are going to start today's session and we are meeting with Dr. Um, Joseph Ojo and he is a senior program manager at Collins Aerospace. And first, I want to thank you for uh, coming here to chat with us. Could you provide us a little bit more insight into your background, what you studied in school, university, and then how did you end up at Collins Aerospace? Oh yeah, oh, great. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's always good to have you know good meaningful conversation with you. My name is Joseph Hojo. Uh, my background uh, uh, did my undergrad uh, University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Uh, graduated uh, with electrical engineering uh, technology background. I, I was actually in the process of going to grad school, and I was recruited by. Uh, Collins Aerospace. I mean, back then we, we used to call it Rockwell Collins. So I took a I took a break from grad school, came to Iowa from North Carolina, <laughs> uh, which was a huge, you know, huge difference, especially with with the weather. But no, it was a great it was a great decision. And I've started and I started working uh, with you know Collins Aerospace at that time. What was actually great about working for Collins Aerospace and you know starting the career hell is most of you know these big companies and good companies they offer the opportunity to actually further your education, which I definitely took advantage of. I I was recruited as a systems engineer and I completed my grad school from Iowa State. You know, go cyclones uh, with my master's uh, of engineering degree in systems engineering. And I was working, you know, as a systems engineer. I transitioned to project engineering. And I decided, you know, to pursue, to dive a little bit more into business. So I, I pursued my MBA, uh, specializing in technology management. After I completed my MBA, that is when I started you know, working as a program manager. So I've been working as a program manager now for about 14 years, you know, managing from small, mid, large uh, programs from research and development programs, new, new technology development programs, aftermarket programs. I have that, you know, end-to-end -end experience in managing a cross-functional team, cross-functional programs, complex programs. And yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited. I, I had a little bit of break in the career. I went to management consulting for a couple of years, and uh, which really helped. Uh, I gained a lot of experience to working with a lot of C-suits in this high tech industry. And I came back to Collins Aerospace, to Aerospace and Defense, because I just, I, I, Aerospace and Defense, I feel like it's my bread and butter. Uh, I enjoy it. I, I love it so much. In the process too, I was able to uh, complete my, uh, my doctorate degree. One of the person uh, that actually inspired me to go for my doctorate degrees, you know, Dr. Maurice Dunson that I'm talking to <laughs> today. So I was able to uh, accomplish that. And the doctorate in, I was able to get my doctorate in executive leadership, which for me actually means a lot from the context of being a program manager. Because literature, as we dive more into our conversation, literature has proven, and even with my experience, that to be a successful program manager, you need <clears throat> impeccable leadership skills. So going through the you know the executive and doctoral level in, in executive leadership helped me to immerse myself in in leadership, you know, literature, uh, leadership philosophy that has actually helped me to be more successful uh, as a program manager. And currently, I'm. Uh, I'm leading a lot of you know complex program, working with our building blocks in the whole avionics of Collins Aerospace, trying to think through how we can have more modular technology uh, that our customer really find a lot of advantage on. I mean, these are technology that our military co um, contracts are using, technology that our commercial contracts are using, and just the ability to cast that strategic vision and to be able to lead the team to accomplish that goals, those are the things that really excite me. That is what I'm. That's what I'm doing right now. I think it's key to note that when you manage, manage, you were in management consulting. You were here in Chicago, and now you're back in Iowa. So, so there must be something special about Iowa. So, for those students who may listen, 
Um, what attracts you to living and working in Cedar Rapids, Iowa? Oh, uh, you know, great question. And one of the things that I always tell people is depending on where you are in, in your life, in your career, I, I think sometimes you have to be flexible and you have to have that flexibility to move uh, to different locations because you never know where the opportunity will take you. I mean, uh, I, I'm sure... Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people that have progressed in their career, they've moved around a little bit. One of the things that attracted me to come back to Iowa is, like I said, I actually started my career in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So I am familiar with the area. Uh, I know the area. I'm used to the area. It is true. I went to Chicago, and Chicago is a beautiful city, which is great. But when the opportunity uh, comes again to come back to Iowa, it was not too much of a difficult decision for me because I'm already used to the area. I have the experience. I know the people. I know the location, which personally makes it uh, much easier for me to come back. I know that if it's a different area or a different region, maybe Ohio or Nebraska, it might be a challenging decision to just move there. But I mean, I, I've spent a couple of years already in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I, I like the people. The school system is great. It's a great place to raise children. So especially for, I mean, it, like I said, it, it depends on where you are in your life. So it it was it just makes sense to to come back, and the opportunity was great too. So that is one of the reasons I was, you know, okay to, you know, leave Chicago. There were okay to leave to Chicago at the time and come to Cedar uh, Rapids, Iowa. Oh, awesome answer. So I'm going to ask some more uh, program manager specific questions. So can you share your experience in overseeing large-scale programs at Collins Aerospace and highlight key strategies you've employed for successful program management? Good question. And uh, currently, I'm, that, that is what I've been doing for a couple of years. I'm currently still still overseeing you know, large-scale program. There's a lot of skills uh, that I needed uh, that are involved in in managing large scale program. I would I would say that those skills are divided into two. You need to have you know, impeccable and, and leadership skills to be able to lead diverse and multiple teams. And I always say that to program managers. Yeah, I mean, it's good to invest in functional and program management skills. That is great. But to be successful, you need you know, leadership skills. That is just, uh, especially when you are dealing with you know, like complex, large scale, a multi-facet program, uh, that is one skill set uh, that I believe is extremely important. And even literature proves that you need uh, key uh, my, um, my, uh, leadership skills. The second skill is communication skills. And when I say communication, I feel like a lot of people talk about communication skills, but you, when we start peeling the you know, onion out of communication skills. I mean, you you live and die by how you communicate. And one of the one of the problems that I've seen like a lot of program managers, how they fail is their lack of communication and awareness. Either you are communicating up or you are communicating down. We need to understand that when you are dealing with like a large scale programs, most of the time they are probably complex. And the fact that they are complex or you're having challenging in those programs, that is not always the end of the world. But the key is that how do you communicate your problems to your leadership? How do you communicate your issues and your challenges to your stakeholders? How do you communicate uh, what is going on uh, with, the, uh, with the organization? I think that is extremely important. The third skill is you know, something we call R and house rules and responsibility. Before you start a program, you need to be very explicit on rules and responsibility. I know who is who has the ownership and accountability of every single domain and scope of the program, so that you can be able to ask the right question. You know the right person to go to. You have the ability to all to hold people accountable for what they are doing or for what they are not doing. You understand, and uh, you can ask the those you know double edged questions to test the pressure point of all the programs. And if there's a either performance issues or a challenge in the area, you know where to go to communicate that and make those change rapidly. So on, on, on holding people accountable and 
The last thing is just as a leader, as a program manager for a large scale, you have to understand that you are the leader of the program. And one of your key job is to ensure that every member of your team are successful. If they are not successful, you are not successful. So you have to have the mindset of what exactly am I doing or how can I be part of the solution? How can I make sure that this electrical engineer, this software engineer, this project lead is successful in what they are doing and what, what type of help can I render to ensure that they are successful? So those are the five key areas that I feel like uh, a, a program manager that is managing large scale you need to pay attention to because you cannot be an expert on everything, but each person that is responsible for each part of your program, you have to be able to communicate with them, ask them the right question, and most importantly, ask them what can you do to help? What are your challenges? What are your pain points? And as a leader, it's our job to make sure that we find those help for them uh, to make sure that they are successful in, in executing and accomplishing their milestones. So, Ojo, as a senior program manager, like how do you approach balancing competing priorities, right? So we know there's a scope, a schedule, performance. Like how do you balance all of that? Good, good question. It, it, it depends on the program. And one of the things, too, uh, that we do in the beginning of, of the program is we – we talked about like what are the most important requirements? We call it our your marks, right? What are your most important requirements? Because all programs are not created equal. Some programs, you know, uh, cost is the most important thing because you you are only dealing with the money that you have. You cannot get more money. Some program like schedule is king. Um, the customer or stakeholders might be flexible for with uh, with cash or with money but the schedule is so important uh, to the uh, to the customer. So understanding the most important requirement, I, I feel like it's important to balance the priorities because that will kind of like guide on what your priority is for the program. And one of the other, and you are talking about program now. Now let's, let's, let's take it to like a macro level. In an organization, you have a lot of programs in an organization, and you as a program manager, your program is just one of like 10, 20, 30 programs. So again, as a program manager, you have to have the skill set to be able to advocate for your program to make sure that the senior leadership are seeing it as the priority for the organization. So how do you even balance the priority of your program from the context? Of a bigger uh, organization, that's another skill set that uh, that that is challenging for a lot of program manager. And how you overcome that is is just kind of sticking with the fact communication and the implication of you know if we don't do what we say we're going to do and what that means to our customer and what that means to our company. And if you can communicate that to your uh, senior leaders. I believe that, you know, I, I trust my leaders to be able to make the right decision for the customer, for the organization, and assign all those priorities. But it comes with you having a good communication skills, understanding, you know, what is important to your customer, understanding what is important to your program, understanding, you know, the key pain points, and get those priorities from your team and even from your organization. It's great you mentioned communication. So, you know, collaboration is crucial in program management. So how do you foster effective communications and collaboration amongst diverse teams on different aspects of a program? You know, when you say diverse team, I th that's a very interesting thing. And one of the things about communication is that as a leader, you have to have the right situational awareness when it comes to communication. And there's a context about leadership that talks about like situational leadership skills, where it talks about, you know, depending on who you are communicating with or you are leading, you need to calibrate uh, to make sure that you are you are communicating or leading them at, I mean, at, at, their, at their level. Having that situational uh, awareness is extremely important so that you understand their maturity level and how you can communicate and deal with them. I feel like as a program manager too, it's extremely important. And the reason I said 
uh, situational awareness is important is the way you will communicate with your you know, executive VPs and president is different from the way you will communicate to your engineering team or you will communicate with your operation teams or you will communicate with your testers because everybody have their own vested interest. You know, the way you are going to talk to the CFO of the organization based on his vested interest is different from maybe how you are going to talk to the VP of engineering. So understanding your audience is extremely important. Uh, that is one of the key things that can help you to facilitate a, an effective uh, communication. And, and the second thing is just having an open, clear communication is key. I mean, communicating based on fact and communicating based on the vision of the program. And most importantly, it's actually not just about you doing the talking. But com listening is a huge part of communication too. So listening to the, you know, to the challenges of the team and understanding where they are coming from and actually your ability to internalize those concerns and communicate the vision of the program, I think it's extremely important. So uh, I believe having an open, transparent uh, communication, effective and efficient communication is extremely important. How you foster that is having those frequent touch points, uh, either is, you know, verbally or by the end of the day, by the end of the week, you know, status of the program, uh, making sure that you are checking in with all the stakeholders of the organization, having those, you know, direct pointed questions and, and just create an environment where people are free to even give you bad news and communicate those information to you. Uh, I think that is one of the key things that can really help you to be successful when you are communicating with people. I think cultural awareness too is extremely important. You know, when, when you're working with diverse things, especially when you're working with people from India and Japan or Europe, it's important as a leader to have those cult, uh, cultural awareness because so, so that you can have some sensitivity in when you are driving and when you are communicating to those diverse uh, teams so that they can, you know, they always say that it's not about what you say, uh, Maurice, it's about how people receive what you are saying. So you need to make sure that the people you are communicating to, they are receiving your information and your communication well. So, Ojo, it seems like there's a lot of things that you have to think about. So what type of training have you done or education in addition to prepare you for this role? To be honest with you, I will say my doctorate in executive leadership is probably the best thing that I've ever done. To, that have prepared me to be a, a real successful you know, program manager. I, I believe to be a successful program manager and to get into this role, you have to immerse yourself in leadership skills. You need to know what leadership is, Maurice. You, you need to know it. And you have to be able to lead with some you know, key critical leadership skills. To, because I mean, at the end of the day, as a program manager, you, you are trying to influence people to get where they uh, to to accomplish a strategic goal of a program. That is what you are trying to do. And if you think of what the definition of leadership is an influential relationship to, I mean, to the people you are leading. So be, be, knowing what leadership is and knowing how to lead and being an eff efficient and effective leader, I feel like it's one of those things that is, is a key skill set that have prepared me and help me to be successful uh, in this role. So I would say that that is the key training that have really helped me to be successful in this role. Now, Ojo, you have a master of business administration as well, right? Yes, I do. Do you think that prepared you as well, or that just gave you more of like the general business skills since you have an engineering undergraduate? Uh, you know, I, I think it does. I think it does to to some to some extent, and because having a MBA and uh, it helps you improve your business acumen. As a program manager, you need to, uh, you are like a business operation. You need to have the right business acumen to be able to understand and grasp, you know, uh, how to run a business and how to make those business de decisions, how to understand profit and losses. Those are, those are functional skills that you still need to have to be successful. Absolutely. I mean, they helped and, and, and they prepare me. But the point that I'm trying to make that I don't want us to lose is you can have 
you know, all these functional skills. You can have, you can go to like an Ivy League school, have your MBA. Yeah, I mean, you can be a fantastic en engineering uh, background. You can have all those things, right? You can have key business skills. But if you have deficiency in leadership skills, I believe you know you are still gonna struggle to be a successful or an efficient program manager. And then here's another question. I remember years ago at Collins as a program manager, you were responsible for the entire life cycle of the program or project. However, you didn't control the engineers. They were actually managed by the engineering managers. And so I believe that was one of the most difficult things. Like you control the budget and you're responsible for the project or program, but you really didn't have the amount of influence over the engineers that charge your program that you needed to get the job done. Is it still the same? And then how do you navigate that? Because that is extremely complex. It, it is still the same. And going back to what I said, uh, you, you mentioned the key thing. You said that you need to influence these engineers, right? To, to do your job, to accomplish what you are trying to do. And that is where I believe on uh, successful program managers and the program managers that fails, that is what I believe separate them. Uh, what uh, your ability to be able to influence, you know, other stakeholders that doesn't report to you, um, and you being able to influence them to articulate and communicate your goal and get them on board to be dedicated and to accomplish those goals. That is the challenge of the pro, and that is what I believe that having those critical leadership skills will help and prepare you to be able to uh to accomplish because you are trying to influence people that you know doesn't doesn't report to you and you know they, they might have other priorities that they need to work on how do you get them excited you know th there's a part of leadership skill that is called transformational leadership how, how do you inspire them how do you motivate them i i, I mean so th those are the key things that i feel like you can have all the business skills or the functional skills, but if you don't have those key leadership skills to be able to inspire, motivate, and cast those strategic vision for those engineers to, I mean, to work on your to on your project, it, it's it's going to be challenging. But how um, practically you do that is, I mean, for every program, obviously there's a program charter. We have roles and responsibility. It's my role as a program manager to articulate and communicate what I need for my program to be successful to the engineering leaders. And they have the responsibility, even though I have the ownership and the budget of the program, they have the responsibility, you know, to do the work. So it's a collaboration uh, of us working together, of me communicating my need, escalating my need. And, and in most cases, they provide the resources uh, for me, for my program to be successful. So yeah, it's, there's a huge challenge there because there's a competing priorities, but I believe uh, one of the things that can, you know, help you to be successful is understanding how to influence people to help you to accomplish your, your goals and, you know, communicating your, you know, your, your program goals and making sure that you get the right help. Uh, and if you're not getting the right help from your peers, escalate it to the next level senior executive to help you to be successful. And that I believe those are the those are the ways you can you can walk through it and make sure that you're successful. So continuous improvement is essential for long term success. So how do you instill a culture of continuous improvement within your program teams? And can you share any specific examples of lessons learned from being applied to enhance program performance? You know, that's a very good question. Uh, and I like the fact that you 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 ask that uh, you ask the question. Continuous improvement can be done from uh, any aspect of the program. And what I always tell my team is that we're a learning organization. We have to continue to learn. And just having the mindset of always of always being a, a learner and being a learning organization really helps us to you know continue to improve and understand. One of the ways that we we've done in uh, I typically do continuous improvement program management is when I lead an executive program uh at the end of the program uh th there's a review that we do that we actually kind of like 
go through the uh, the retrospect of the program and think through you know what are the things that that went wrong what are the things that I um, mean that that went right not only the things that went wrong a lot of organizations they only focus on things that went wrong right and they try to have a continuous improvement on that but I, I don't believe in that I believe that you should think through what are the things that went wrong and what are actually the things that we did right and I mean, the things that we did right, why did we do it right? What are the situation? I mean, is it just an accident or there's something in our process that helps us to do it right? Which is great. Those are our strengths. Let's continue to build on that. The things that we did wrong, then, you know, like we will talk more about it. How did they happen? Why did they happen? What are the processes or technology or even the people that we need to put in place to make sure that uh, that this doesn't happen again. So that is definitely one of the key things in program management that we do uh, to improve continuous improvement. Now, based on the dynamic program and dynamic organization that we have, I, I don't believe in actually waiting till the end of the program to do that, uh, Maurice. I actually, uh, this is something that I do on a quarterly basis. I do a retrospect on, you know, this car based on our, uh, financial results, right? And we have a value metrics. Maybe we have a poor CPI or a poor SPI. What is going on? What happened? What are the drivers of those things? Then we intentionally put actions together to make sure that we not only mitigate those bad performance, but how do we make sure that it doesn't happen again in the future? So now we are integrating and incorporating real-time continuous impro improvement in our program management, because we don't have we don't have the end of the of the program to wait. We want to make that improvement now so that it can affect the rest of uh, before you complete the program. So those are the things uh, that that I do, uh, you know, on a daily, monthly basis to affect you know uh, continuous improvement in the pro uh, in the program. It goes to understanding uh, what happened, what went wrong. Second thing is that taking intentional and meaningful actions uh, of mitigating or fixing. And the third is putting a KPI in, in place. KPI is a key performance index to actually monitor and manage that the improvement or the action that you took is actually working. So those are the key, uh, key steps that you can you know, continue to enhance continuous improvement uh, in your program. So... As a senior program manager, how do you stay abreast of emerging trends and technologies in the aerospace industry? And then how do you incorporate innovation into your program strategies? You know, this is an interesting question. And this is something that I feel like as an organization, as a program manager, you know, as a person, and even as an industry as a whole, we need to improve on. Because when you are a program manager, sometimes you have, you have some programs that are just really stressful, that you are, you are really focused on putting a lot of hours, trying to make sure that the program is successful. And sometimes we, program managers, we don't, we, we don't sit back and actually think about the big picture. Like, okay, what are the other things that is going on in the industry, in the technology world? that can actually help and improve because people are just, some people are just really busy and they don't even have a breathing space to do that, which I think it, it, it's a huge disadvantage. And what I've been doing is I've been a little bit more intentional in making sure that uh, I understand like what is going on. And what, 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 when we say that what is going on, it's not just only the technology. The question is what exactly is going on even with our customer. Because one thing that we don't want to lose our sight of our sight is what is our customer thinking? What type of things are important to our customer? What type of technology does our customer, our stakeholders, either the, either the military or even the commercial that they really want? What are the problems that they are trying to solve? Those That is kind of like one of the questions. And the second thing is what are the technology that is available? to actually solve those questions. So that is kind of the area that I look at things. And one of the ways that we've been able to overcome that is that we have you know, strong business development organization that are very close to our customers. And they are the ones that are trying to understand 
What are these customer requirements? What are the technologies uh, that can that the customer really need or do they want? What are the problems that they are that they are facing? What is the next 35, 10, 15 years that our customer is looking? So they relay those information to me as a program uh, manager. And one and the other resources that I use is actually outside resources, like going to conferences and making sure that I understand the technologies uh, that are available to solve those key uh, those key problems or those key response to the customer. So it is a two different aspect of it. I mean, first things that we need to understand the problems that are in the industry and in the market and what our customer really want. Make sure that we're getting those information. We have a good pipeline on how that is coming to us. And the second thing is to look have a strong you know, research and development organization that collaborate with universities like yours, uh, Dr. Dawson, and, and, and they just work on a lot of research and development that we, I engage with to make sure that we're still on top of you know, the technology and how we can satisfy our stakeholders and solve their key problems. So Ojo, can you discuss how your team addresses challenges related to scalability when managing programs of varying sizes and complexities within Collins. Our team addresses challenges related to scalability with managing programs of it. It, dep it depends on the challenges. One of the challenges that I can tell you for sure that uh, we've been having is just some, you know, resources challenges, just having the, you know, bright technical SMEs that can help us to you know, to I mean, there's a lot of scarcity on the right talent now in the industry, and the the question is, I mean, we have a lot of programs, so the key is that there's just not enough technical resources that um that can work on those programs that have the right skill set to expedite and to move things along as much as we would like. One of the ways that we've been able to collaborate and start thinking from a different point of view to solve that critical challenge is to think outside of the box, right? To start engaging with like, you know, like strategic relationship with, you know, with sourcing organization, with recruiting firm. There are some companies, you know, that they just, for example, there are some companies that just focus on FPGAs, just designing FPGAs. So we've been able to collaborate with those organizations and I mean, they have the resources, they have the talent. I mean, we don't need to hire a bunch of people and try to train them, they're already trained. So that, that's one way that we can, you know, do a strategic collaboration with these, you know, small companies or mid companies that have key resources that can help us to be successful. So that help us to actually have the ability to scale all the programs that we're, that we're executing because we're not, the, the lead time of hiring full-time employee is just way too long. So we leverage, you know, those strategic relationships to, to get um, talented resources. We leverage outsourcing some of the work offshore, like, you know, we've used, you know, Indian and we've used some, you know, European, European countries to make sure that we're getting uh, the right talent. I mean, there's some value in that. And there's not so much burden on trying to, you know, find this talent that is going to take too long and we're going to miss our milestone. So it, it, it depends. It depends on the problems, but we've been able to come up with some creative ways, you know, to to solve some of the you know challenges that we have that can help us to scale our program execution. And that is one of the things that we've uh, that we've been able to do, just having diverse uh, resources and diverse diverse talent pool to help us to be successful. So I have two two final questions, right? So first, um, if I, you know, I'm a fresh graduate and I wanted to come work at Collins in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, what would I need to do? Fresh graduate. <laughs> Actually, the process is not as challenging uh, as uh, as you might think. I mean, it depends on obviously what you want to do. Obviously, I mean, we have a lot of career path. 
not only engineering, we have, you know, we have business, we have business, we have HR, we have operations. So yeah, it's just about like, you know, having, I mean, majoring in the, in the major that is related to, to careers in, in rock, in rock work, in, I said rock work Collins, that used to be our name, in Collins, in Collins Aerospace. And, and, and the best way to go is actually to apply. I mean, we have good talent um, management organization that that do a pretty good long job in in looking at these you know resumes and, and calling sort of space to they are very involved we do a lot of university outreach i mean they go to aims they go to a lot of universities that uh, we have alumni to actually do recruiting that is how i was actually able to get recruited because calling sort of space actually came to the university that i was that i was in grad school with and I, it was actually an interesting story. I was going to the restroom and I saw the table on the hallway and I stopped by and hey, <laughs> here I am in Collins Aerospace. So yeah, I mean, Collins Aerospace, you know, like they, they go to a lot of conferences. We, we go to a lot of university to do recruiting. And, and if we don't have the opportunity, you know, to come to your campus or university, you can you know, update your resume and just apply online. And yeah, and somebody is going to contact you if there's a match and we can, and there's going to be a lot of opportunities. I know that we need, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in the organization and we definitely need the right talent in the company. And the final question, for the young student that's watching this and they see you and they want to be you in the future, how do they get there? Like what would be, these steps to become you. <laughs> wow, you flatter me. Uh, no, uh, I, if I go, if I go through my background, one of the things that have really helped me. I mean, obviously, you know, God. Um, God is very important in my life, so I would say, you know, like God has really helped. I mean, but beyond that, it's just to. It's just to be focused and really know what you want. And what I mean by that is, you know. I, I went through college being very being very focused and I mean I was able to measure to to major in a good in a good uh, undergrad uh, degree and that is the first step. I would say one of the things too that helped is while you are in college, uh, try to get an internship if you can because uh, from the process of internship you might even be able to get full time uh, uh, opportunities. Other things that I've helped is just your work ethics. You know, there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing that is beyond having impeccable and great work ethics. Work hard and learn as much as you can. I feel like that is very important. Learn as much, continue to learn, not only while working, even most importantly, I mean, from education, from certification, from conferences, Continue to be some someone that is curious enough that always want to learn. Networking is important too. I mean, have the right mentor in the industry. Have people that you know that can talk to you, give you advice that you can bounce ad advice with. But it comes with like you know, I would say your work ethics is extremely important. Continue to learn. That's extremely important. Set some goals for yourself. Say like one year, three years, five years, 10 years goals. What what do you want to do? And why do you want what you want to do? And put key actions in place to accomplish those goals. And I believe that you you are capable to get to, you know, wherever you want to get to. All right. Well, Ojo, many thanks. Many thanks for participating and providing your insights. Uh, I'm going to close this off and... Hopefully we see you next year at our uh, conference here in Chicago. Absolutely. I, I look forward to it. And I think it's going to be great. Uh, and Dr. Dunson, thank you for all the things that you do in in the literature community and continue to educate, you know, people to be the best version of themselves. So, you know, proud of you and I'm excited. Let me know what I can do to help. Thank you. Now you're getting me teary-eyed. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, bud. Yeah, bye.